Hello everyone, Dr. Anna Kabeca here, and today we're going to talk about what happens to our bodies, our hormones, our life from 40 and beyond. So let's talk about what happens in our 40s. And today we're going to hit topics such as our menstruation, our menstrual cycle, what's happening hormonally, what's going on with our thyroid. And to discuss this, I am bringing on a very long distance friend, Dr. Lara Bryden. And she has written this amazing book called The Period Repair Manual, which she has featured a comment or two from me in. And so I'm really proud about that as well. It's a fantastic resource. I've had her on Couch Talk before. We've gotten a lot of questions and interactions and I'm so happy to bring her back to talk about her new and revised book, The Period Repair Manual. And we'll hit on some birth control topics too, because that's a big issue as well. Many women are told in their 40s, okay, let's just put you on birth control until you're done menopause and we'll take it off. Well, we'll talk a little bit about why that is so damaging as well. So let me introduce Lara Bryden. Today, she is a naturopath and she is coming to us all the way from Australia. And yeah. we're in Australia. Actually, I'm in New Zealand this morning. I'm in oh, New, Zealand. New Zealand today, but my clinic is in Sydney, Australia. Okay, I, well, coming from I, New Zealand. I, yeah, I divide my time between the two countries. Yeah. That is but I'm, awesome. from, but I'm from Canada, so I'm an yeah, international. <laughs> I know. We've spoken, I think the last time I interviewed you, you were in Canada. One other time we spoke, you were in Australia. And so now, <laughs> so is home in New Zealand and then your clinic's in Sydney? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, good. Well, all over the, so my international friend, Dr. Lara Bryden. So she is a naturopathic doctor with over 20 years experience in women's health. And as I mentioned, her book, The Period Repair Manual, Natural Treatment for Better Hormones and Better Periods is my go-to resource and the number one book I recommend. I am having my daughters read this over the holidays, <laughs> maybe not over the mm -hmm. holidays, but this is their resource because sometimes when mom speaks, daughters don't necessarily listen, but when we say the information is coming from New Zealand and Australia, <laughs> from Dr. Lara Bryden, I think I'll get much better, um, much better interaction from them as well. So again, Lara, it's great to have you here today. Well, thanks so much, Anna. It's always lovely to chat with you. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Me too. So let's just start, like, you know, let's talk about what happens in your 40s. And so, you know, we have, I'm an OBGYN, you're a naturopath with women's health focus. And, and so what is, you know, what are you seeing happening in women in their 40s? And I'd love to talk about this hormonal roller coaster that many of us, if not most of us, have a journey on. <laughs> Absolutely. So the endocrinologist, Dr. Jalen Pryor, who helped me with this book, she does a nice analogy. Maybe other people do this analogy that our 40s are kind of a parallel or equivalent to our teenage years. So, you know, during our teenage years, our cycles are ramping up, getting more, becoming more regular. We're not making a lot of progesterone yet, but we're just trying to get in the groove. And then at the other end of things in our 40s, progesterone starts to drop away, estrogen starts to do some funny things, cycles can become a little bit irregular or not, but definitely there are some hormonal changes happening. And so along with that, it makes sense. There are going to be some changes with our, potentially with our mood and sleep and periods. So the, the problems that I highlight in chapter 10 of my book, which is the what happens in our 40s chapter, I talk about yeah, mood disturbance, sleep, heavy heavy periods, what are called flooding periods for some women, unfortunately. And then kind of what happens later as we transition into menopause with dryness and atrophy and concerns about bone health and things like that. Yeah, and that is exactly, that exactly true. And that these early, early um, changes, when we interact, when we intervene early, we have a much better longevity, quality of life. And yesterday I was at the gym and um, a uh, woman I recognized was there and she's like, oh man, you know, I just, she was telling me that she loves Mighty Maka and she's working <laughs> out. And, and I said, you know, today I just thought of the expressions like I am 
younger than most people my age, you know, we were just thinking about that. She was older too. I didn't know how old at the time, but I kind of love just kind of, how do you think about yourself? Well, I'm younger than most people my age, right? And, um, and that's a good way to think about yourself. But yet I asked her, I said, well, how old are you? I was thinking, you know, 54, she's 68 years old. And I said, okay, <laughs> okay beautiful, really flawless skin and just energetic, toned. And I said, well, Yolanda, what do you do? What's your regimen? And she goes, well, number one, I just started taking care of myself in my, you know, 30s, in my mid 30s, late 30s, I started taking care of my skin. And I started looking at my nutrition and making sure I was exercising five to six days a week. And I've, and I have done this every week since then, you know, regularly taking care of myself. And, and so, um, so those, those little things can go a long way. And the earlier we're able to start, we can clear up those symptoms of, you know, hormone imbalance, the perimenopause roller coaster, or premenopause roller coaster, and sort that sort that out so that it really affects us when we don't even have to deal with our periods anymore. So I think my point here was that what we can do early on, you know, so improves our quality of life later on, but there's never, it's never too late to start as well. I, I couldn't agree more. I think I, I will, I give that exact message to a number of my patients. It's like, let's work now in your early forties to kind of to get your hormone receptors stabilized, not too much estrogen, support your progesterone, support your nervous system, support, support your adrenal interaction function access. And all of that's going to translate into an easier transition later and you know, a more yeah, sort of vital hormonal system even after periods stop. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's worthwhile investing sooner rather than later. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talking about let's talk about what's going on with this, the heavy periods and and how that relates to the hormonal imbalance that's also the culprit for thyroid disease during this time. You know, it's like kicked yeah. off in our forties. Yeah. So the phrase is thyropause. So there's a little <laughs> section in my book about that when thyroid, when perimenopause and thyroid intersect, that can be a confusing time. It, you know, they can be um, because they have similar symptoms, of course, when thyroid goes underactive, you can have sleep disturbance, heavy periods, irregular periods. And of course, the two hormonal systems, thyroid and female hormones, interact with each other so they can compound each other. I think, you know, at the heart of it, I th- and maybe you can say whether you agree with this, I think one of the big changes that happens in our 40s is we start to lose progesterone. It's just not, it's a difficult hormone to make. To begin with, it requires a lot of vitality of the over ovarian follicles, and I, you know it's, it's just a natural process that we're going to make less in our forties. I don't think of it as a one message in my book is that it's not a failure of us, you know, in, ter- in terms of our health or our nutrition. It, it's just a natural process that the follicle ovarian follicles become less active. So losing progesterone puts us at risk of many things, including well, we mentioned thyroid, including potentially autoimmune thyroid because progesterone has a regulating anti-inflammatory effect on the immune system and it also directly supports thyroid. So that can be a double whammy when we lose progesterone, we're at greater risk of autoimmune thyroid disease, for example. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. That decline of progesterone starting in the mid thirties on, right? And really we attribute that to, and I want to talk about maintaining your vitality to nurture progesterone as long as possible, because that's really key. But often, like that's one of the big things that I supplement with is progesterone, bioidentical progesterone, and also using nutrients to support our body's own natural production and detox, you know, of progesterone, as well as detoxification of, you know, the endocrine disruptors that can throw our ovaries for a loop. But I would like to emphasize that I want women to know this transition time period, you know, we think back to when we started our periods, that was a huge transition time period for our bodies. And there's a period of adjustment. And research shows that we do better if we don't um, 
interfere with the natural process, but it doesn't mean the unnatural process, right? We want to yeah. not interfere with the natural process. The same thing in the perimenopause, postmenopause. We want to support the natural process as much as possible into this transition. So with that said, I am, you know, a fan of you know, lowest effective dosages, just doing what we need to do to support the body in this transition time period, because we often live very unnatural lives. So we need this additional support. Would you agree, Lara? I agree. I, I think a natural progesterone supplement, whether it's a cream or in some cases, I think even as a capsule form yeah. can be a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. It's to me, it's like a lifeline for some women. And my, yeah, the way I see it is this is in the context of doing everything else to support the body, but then some just extra help that we need probably because we live in a, the modern world and, you know, exposed to toxins and additional stresses that our ancestors didn't have. And so that's the way I see progesterone as kind of stepping into that space and helping women in a, a, a world that is sort of more challenging than maybe what our body was expecting. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go into, because it just really, I think I want to broaden the understanding for women, what's happening with our hormones when we hit our forties and what's happening with our periods, because the, you know, like, as you mentioned, the irregular bleeding, the breakthrough bleeding, the heavy bleeding that these symptoms often lead to surgeries and hysterectomies and birth control pills and ablations and all these things that can really be avoided in many cases so let's talk about that yeah and i'm so glad we are talking about it because for so long there's been silence around this there's a stigma there's been a stigma around aging and around menopause that i think is one reason why previous generations didn't feel they could speak about it i've had so many conversations with patients where when these sometimes quite frightening symptoms start to happen in their 40s the main feeling seems to be shame you know this is i can't believe this is happening i must have done something wrong i don't want to you know talk to anyone about it i'm just going to do what the doctor says that these might be women who have always chosen natural things who never used breast control before hormonal birth control up to that point but then really feel themselves kind of backed into a corner and not having, being able to have that conversation. So the conversations like this, I think are really, I'm hoping are going to reach a lot of women in their, you know, in that situation, just wondering what to do next. So yes, period, your no. periods look like you don't even recognize them. And it's two factors. It's the, it's just the natural loss of progesterone, as I say in my book, kind of quietly exiting the scene. And you can get it, yes, you can support that with herbal, with maca, you know, with herbal medicines, with nutrition. You can come in with a bit of natural progesterone, but still that, that is probably the reality for most of us. And then at the same time, estrogen has decided to go, as you said, on a roller coaster. It's just having a party for some women. It, the research shows that estrogen in some women can spike up to three times what it was before. So it's an estrogen storm, if you will. Not everyone experiences that, but it can be quite high. And when estrogen goes that high, that's very stimulating for the brain. That can contribute to irritability, to the mood issues that women hadn't experienced before. And also obviously highly stimulating to the uterine lining. And this is where you start to get that potential for things like uterine polyps and heavy flow and without being counterbalanced by progesterone that can start to look like quite scary periods and fibroids breaking through and and but also when you mention moods i always tell women you know if you hate your husband only two weeks out of the month it's probably your hormones not your husband <laughs> but yeah. it really can lead to this and, and i had so many women come into me saying you know i just don't like who i am at this time of the month and just frustrated and lost and it's and scared like what's happening to my brain and my body and um and so this is this is such an important discussion so let's go ahead and don't didn't mean to interrupt but i want to continue no. just yeah. with this discussion because that stimulation of the endometrium and also those peaks those fluctuating um, levels of estrogen later on can you know will continue at some degree and contribute to changes in our internal thermometer and hot flashes and that 
is so embarrassing and, and detrimental to so many women and very preventable as well. So. See, I just, let's talk, speak about that for a minute because my clinical observation is that it's the women who have been exposed to very high estrogen during their perimenopausal 40s that may, do seem to be at more a greater risk of hot flashes later when estrogen drops. And the analogy I think of is the body has gotten used to or kind of calibrated or become addicted to maybe a higher level of estrogen. And so then when it finally drops away, it's a rougher transition. Do you? Well, I that think yeah. this is fascinating because, you know, I've been digging deep into hot flash research and, yeah. you know, and, and it's, it's very fascinating when it comes to it. Like one of the key things is insulin sensitivity, decreased hot flashes, higher insulin resistance, increased hot flashes. Yeah. So we want to think about estrogen sensitivity then, like what your observation is. There must be, and I've never heard that term, just making it up. But if we yeah. think about estrogen sensitivity, right? Or estrogen resistance, you know, is there that high estrogen because there's such an estrogen resistance and then the fluctuating levels create this almost hypoglycemic effect you know or hot flash effect I mean, not, you know i'm just kind of making an analogy there yeah. to kind of wonder if this isn't part of the complex that creates some women having really tremendously disruptive hot flashes for many many years yeah yeah that's an interesting analogy i mean estrogen is powerful it, it i think mm -hmm. of it too almost like a drug to, you know, we, it, it, um, my observation is we do, we can become addicted to it. And that, certainly that can happen too when women are using a, like a high dose conventional kind of hormone replacement later. So and true. Try to come off it. It's like, you can't just come off it. It's like a drug. Yeah. You have to wean it down. And this goes back to, I heard you say the phrase earlier, I think just, just the, the minimum amount. Like if, if a woman's going to use estrogen, I really think it's just a dusting, just the just enough to relieve the symptoms and no more because it's then just going to be difficult to come off it. And also putting you know, women at risk of some of the symptoms from high dose, the, the side, long term side effects from high dose estrogen. Well, I also think, you know, like for me, starting with progesterone and DHEA, starting more of those natural roots with these ingredients that are, they're called grass ingredients, generally recognized as safe, right? So there are safer are safer components. But speaking of estrogen addiction, I remember having a client come to me and she had been on estrogen injections for her perimenopause menopause symptoms. And when I checked her levels, her estrogen levels were 600. Now y'all listen, the level should be like 60, 60 yeah. to hundred at peak, you know, we're really looking at, so 600. It took her, it took us almost a year to get her down to a physiologic level of estrogen. So there may be something to this kind of tolerance to these high yes. peak levels of estrogen and almost an addictive, you know, or, yeah. or a um, need for that level because it, it is hard to come off. And we never speak about that. Um, but women who, you know, went through our early 2001, 2002 women's health initiative um, yes. backlash of the stop yeah. the hormone right away because you're going to get breast cancer. Of course, we found out much more, dug into the research and looked at what was real and not real about that. But women had tremendous, you know, cold turkey stopping created a backlash of women just like, I don't care what my risk of death is, give me my hormones, right? Yeah. And of course, again, when we use bioidentical hormones we and bioidentical progesterone, there was progestin that was used in that study. We've reduced that. We've eliminated that risk completely. So... So I, I, that's a good point. Yeah, that was a scary time. Just what, yeah, I was practicing then too, and every, all women just came off. They were, and, and also they were scared, but their doctors were giving them a real kind of scolding and scare tactic if they, you know, if they wanted me any kind of hormonal support. And there was a lot of suffering. And I did not, you know, I was, yeah, that's probably like you, I was trying to come in with some gentler, identical options at that point, just to, to, the word that keeps coming to mind is to rescue them. Because yes. Some of these hormonal symptoms are very distressing. I don't think we should just be telling women, just deal with it. You know, that's been sort of the message, just you can just suck it up and cope with it. It's like, no, sometimes it's, you know, they really do need help. One thing I wanted to say about estrogen, and I think you probably agree with this, I'm interested to hear what you say, is I, as a general rule, I, I would prefer that women 
I think they don't need it when they're still menstruating. So during these, in our 40s years, most, for most women, I think estrogen is not the way to go. They're already make they're fluctuating. They're making high and then low, but they can do a lot better with just some nutritional support and progesterone. That's where progesterone is the hormone for our 40s. Would you agree with A hundred percent, a hundred percent. The rare exception comes to mind in menstrual migraines where I'd slap on an estrogen patch during those first two days, you know, that yeah. they, they start bleeding to kind of, that's the only, uh, that's the only exception to that rule, but absolutely, we start with progesterone and nutritional detoxification with nutritional. And I'd love to know what your protocol is for the for a woman coming in in 40s now with that hypersensitive uterus causing problems and and with that ovarian cyst right so yeah. often the ovarian cyst which leads also the hormone fluctuations to the breast cyst tender breast yeah. you know and the mood disturbances we talked about I would love to know your approach okay yeah so let's yeah maybe let's let's start with mood because that's the order I did it in my book so I'm just kind of working through the you know the chapters um and before I even say that, I'll just make a comment that what we've just both agreed that the estrogen is not the way to go, especially in your early 40s. But that is possibly the only tool in your doctor's toolbox. Like the, the doctor, this is the conversation that happens. It's like, okay, you're suffering. You're a bit young to have hormone replacement. And by that, they mean estrogen, but we can try it. And, you know, they give something that, you know, I think is just never going to work very well because often women have more estrogen than they did before anyway. So this is where these alternatives that we're talking about today are just so needed. Um, I have a, so with regard to mood and sleep, I have what I call a rescue prescription, which is progesterone um, combined with magnesium and the amino acid taurine, both of which support something called GABA in the brain, which GABA is our soothing kind of Valium, natural Valium neurotransmitter in the brain and um, we need more of that and progesterone supports GABA as well. So that can work within hours, within days, women can start to feel a bit better. And then we'll, I would look at also some adaptogen herbs. I know you use maca a lot, there's, you know, there's that one, there's um, ashwagandha, some of those other nice soothing herbs to stabilize the what's called the adrenal axis, the communication between the brain and the adrenal glands. That that destabilizes during perimenopause because I think primarily because of the loss of progesterone, which has a, a natural stabilizing effect on that part of our hormone, hormonal system. So I find, you know, every woman gets usually those, certainly the magnesium and taurine, and then usually some progesterone early on. Um, and then I might, you know, start to look at other factors, like of course, self-care, you know, making, maybe cutting back on work a little bit and, a meditation practice, and also the, the knowledge that this won't last forever, that this might feel a bit crazy, you know, this mood happening like you had never seen before, but it's, this is not going to be the new normal forever. It's just during the years leading up to period stopping, and then things tend to settle down. Anyways, I find a lot of women feel quite empowered by that, just knowing that it's, these are symptoms of transition. Yes. It's not not symptoms of just being old and this is how it's always going to be now. Again, with, yes, with well the said. To yeah, the analogies to teenagers, you would, when they get start to feel their hormones changing, you don't think, oh, this is the new, how you're always going to be for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. Take a breather, be kind to yourself, get the yeah. rest you need, nutrition, outside exercise, we tell our kids, right? Yeah. We need to do the same thing, especially during this really delicate somehow volatile feeling time period. <laughs> yeah. I it's agree right. with that recommendation. Yeah. Magnesium is so huge, Lara. So I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, for our listeners too, that so magnesium is so empowering because it's, it's so involved in over, we know that it's involved in over 200 catalytic reactions in our body and yeah. just has so many benefits and our soil is magnesium deficient. So we're just not getting enough. So too, it, it is one of the, my, it's one of my bedtime capsules that I do and as well as my Epsom salt baths and my magnesium spray and my magnesium mm -hmm. capsules. I'm like, I need that magnesium. Do you know what else magnesium helps with? You mentioned it earlier, but insulin. So in our forties is also when we're 
all of us, you know, at greater risk of insulin resistance, which is the pre-diabetic condition, which is very important. And actually, if that's part of the picture of what's happening, that this is a good time to try to get on top of that with, um, I would say, cutting sugar from the diet, taking magnesium, you know, eating, being fully nourished with healthy meals, getting some exercise. That stabilizing insulin can also improve mood and help stabilize the female hormonal system as well. There's so much interplay between the different. Yes. And as we said, getting regular meals, that means meals without snacking. So let's cut out the snacks because we don't need them. We don't need to eat between meals and that creates insulin resistance. And we want the opposite. We want insulin sensitivity. So we talk about nourishing our body. Let's just leave out the snacks. I agree with that. On the topic of mood, I was going to mention something called histamine intolerance. Do you work with that very much with your clients? It's just come onto my radar lately as something that is commonly, I, I see it commonly kind of flaring up during our 40s. Taurine intolerance? No, histamine intolerance. Oh, histamine intolerance. It, explain yeah. that. That's interesting. Yeah. So histamine is a, a, it's a part of the nervous system. It also has a hormonal effect. It also has a neurotransmitter effect in the brain. It's a normal part of the body. Um, it's involved in allergies, but it can also, we can have, high, if we have too high levels at other times, it can lead to anxiety, um, PMS type symptoms, interfere with ovulation, rashes, mm -hmm. headaches, nasal congestion. These are the kind of menopausal allergies that a lot of women complain about. And I, I, I talk about this in my book because I think it's actually more common than I used to realize. And it, it, there's an interaction with hormones because estrogen increases the release of histamine. It's part of the immune system that's creating all this kind of inflammatory response. And in turn, histamine increases the release of estrogen. It becomes a speed forward with estrogen. Um, and at the same time, to counterbalance that, progesterone can help to clear histamine from the body. So I think um, the relief of histamine intolerance is one of the other ways that progesterone gives such relief. It's, yeah, it's a, a, a lot of people are talking about histamine intolerance now as just an aspect. And we can, can, we can modify it with food as well. So we can remove, it'd be a good time to remove foods that increase the amount of histamine in the body, which I would, would be cows, dairy products, and certain you know, red, red wine and cheeses and anything that gives a flushing or a, a headache tendency is probably a histamine food. That is a great point because it's not something we think about, but many women come in complaining of, you know, rashes, skin irritation, itching, and it's all under the surface, so to speak, or or very yeah. hidden or dry patches and that that could be this histamine yeah. sensitivity. So yeah. you've seen improvement with adding progesterone on during this time? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that the relief of histamine intolerance is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that progesterone and vitamin B6, which also helps to clear histamine, one of the reasons that those supplements work so well for PMS and perimenopausal mood symptoms and perimenopausal allergies. So it's just another simple natural treatment that patients can, that your listeners can think about and maybe read a bit more about histamine foods and, and look at that. Right. Because for PMS, so B6, how much do you recommend of B6 in clients with I used, PMS? And yeah, I used to, called activated B6 or the P5, Pee, yes, like, absolutely. Yeah, I so, don't go super high. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. So there are different forms of B6 that are available over the counter. And so you want P5P, and that is 100% the ideal form. This way your body is not having to, I would say, raw Peter to pay Paul in that expression, yeah. to um, metabolize it into its activated form. So give it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, look, I, I give like... 50 milligrams, kind of 30 to 50 milligrams, sometimes more if someone has severe PMS symptoms. Is that in the range that you would 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. 50 to 100 milligrams. Paradoxal 5-phosphate, it may also be listed that way on your um, B6 bottle. Yeah. So you want to get an activated form. So yeah, that's a good point. You know, I think about in our research and as gynecologists, we definitely know that B6 and calcium are two of the things that improve PMS. But let's talk about calcium is so important, but not from dairy, not from dairy. So um, what are some great sources of calcium you recommend and also supplement with if you do supplement with calcium? I'm big on the dietary sources for sure. Yeah, I don't supplement with a lot of calcium. I don't either. So certainly all green vegetables, you know, nuts and seeds, almonds, salmon. With sardines. Bones. Yes, sardines, the fish with bones. And, and I do, I, with my patients in my work, I do recommend many times goat or sheep dairy because it does not have, does not seem to produce the same inflammatory histamine reaction as normal cow's dairy. So interesting to see if you observe the same with your patients. It's, and it's so easy to obtain now. The nice goat cheeses and um, sheep yogurt. Sheep yogurt was the original yogurt. So it's, you know, it's a kind of a nice traditional food that way. That is so true. I, I don't recommend dairy, but I think when people don't have dairy sensitivity, absolutely goat, yeah. um, sheep, now camel milk are options, right? And there's different ways to get that for sure. Now, I think for me, it was really a big eye opener when I finally did my food sensitivity because I knew I had a cow milk dairy sensitivity, yeah. right? So when I did my food sensitivity testing and it showed me, you know, goat, sheep, everything oh, I sensitive. Oh, I so, but then again, I was probably in a more highly reactive time. So my body was reacting to everything. So I, every once in a while I try it again, I'm still not able to, I will get a, a side effect. And some of that side effect is that histamine reaction that you talked about, mm -hmm. so it, which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. I think I wouldn't be surprised if histamine intolerance plays a role in ovarian cysts as well. This is just pure speculation, but it's involved, histamine's involved in ovulation signaling. And I would love to see a scientist kind of dive into that and look at that a bit more. I don't, you know, at this stage, I don't have any evidence for that, but I, that when it, when someone has recurrent ovarian cysts, I would look at ways to reduce histamine. Well, I think that's fascinating too. And I think ovarian cyst, I think iodine as well, Yes. right? Just boosting up the iodine. So I wonder if histamine is reacting with, at the iodine receptor sites. I'd be curious about that. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. Certainly right. iodine helps to stabilize the estrogen, the estrogen receptors. And well, yeah, you and I are on the same page about iodine. It's great. It can be great for women's health and breast cysts as well, painful breasts. Yes. The caution around that would be for your listeners is just to be careful with their thyroid be careful with the dose and be careful with their thyroid mm -hmm. and preferably with my own patients I like to have a thyroid test before we give any iodine including another test called thyroid antibodies because if that's the autoimmune reaction against the thyroid if those antibodies are high then my my approach is to be very cautious with the dose of iodine do you Agree with hundred percent. Agree, hundred percent. Agree. Check the thyroid antibodies if you're doing any supplemental iodine. You know, above, you know, 150 micrograms, maybe. You know, we would consider that if you're doing long term, 12.5, or in some cases with patients with ovarian cyst and fiber breast cyst, fiber cystic breast, I've used up to 50 milligrams of iodine in clients short term, but I watched their thyroid yeah. antibodies. I never yeah. saw an increase. Never, ever, ever saw an increase, but it was that, you know, I'm going to load you up and let's get rid of these so we don't have to operate. And lo and behold, that worked. Yeah. So. yeah. In that setting, you're done under your supervision. Like yes. That would be great. But I, it worries me if, if women are out there taking 50 milligrams on their own. I, and I don't recommend it. Not realizing what they're doing because you can buy those really high dose iodine online. Right. And, you, and there seems to be no distinction between the ones that have 150 micrograms and the one that have 50,000 micrograms. So that right. there's a big difference. You really need to read the label of an iodine supplement. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree completely. Okay. So we've talked about mood and the perimenopause. Let's talk about the heavy, the, um, the regular cycle and the heavy bleeding. Because that is a big one that, you know, that clients come in, you know, they're in their 
mid to late 30s or early 40s, 40s and beyond, and they're having that heavy bleeding. And, you know, as, as gynecologists, we're like, okay, here's your birth control pill. You know, we're going to add on some Prozac for that PMS. And then if that's not working, we want to um, get on some, uh, um, you know, maybe do an endometrial ablation. And then before you know it, they're getting a hysterectomy because we've never addressed the underlying cause to this. So let's talk about that. And of course, you know, once I, when would you say I'm reformed, once I learned, you know, increased my integrative medicine and functional medicine doctor's bag, I had to do a lot less surgeries. So, yeah. 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 It, yeah. It, it's, um, my expectations are rising about, about heavy periods, even in my book, even in this book that we're talking about today, I do make the statement that sometimes, you know, the natural treatments don't work and you might need something like the Marina, the hormonal IUD. But then the doctor who helped, who helped me with the book, Dr. Pryor, she said, look, she thinks in most cases with the right treatment, especially with natural progesterone in place, it, sh it shouldn't be needed. So the hormonal IUD and the things like ablation are there as a backup plan. But I, yeah, I agree with you. I think for the majority, it doesn't have to reach that stage. And especially if women start treating it as early as possible and get on top of it and not just as I said earlier, like kind of feel ashamed, not sure what's going on, not want to talk to anyone about it. Just talk to someone about it. You know, read my book, speak, to, you know, look at Anna's site and work and find a doctor who can help you with it. So let's think about how to approach it. I do think it's helpful, see what you um, think, to have an assessment from a gynecologist just to see if there's something like adenomyosis. Absolutely. Present. Yeah. An ultrasound, a vaginal probed ultrasound. So yeah. an ultrasound of the uterus, it, it was a, you know, it was just a beautiful tool and I highly recommend it. And for our listeners, insurances typically cover that. If you've got yeah. regular bleeding, pelvic pain or pressure, or discomfort, you know, any, you know, any symptom related to our lower abdomen, et cetera, or bleeding, uh, ultrasounds are usually covered by your insurance company. So that's just an added bonus, but I highly recommend it because that's a good look at the uterus, the uterine lining, the ovaries, and it's a great guidance throughout. What's our baseline? And that helped me tremendously manage my patients. Yeah, I, I agree. No, I, I'd like all my patients to have that. So how common do you think adenomyosis is? You know, it's interesting because I think it's more common now with the increased rates of C-section. So I think post-C-section, you know, whether there's endometrium, getting into myometrium or what the situation is, um, I don't know my, I don't know the statistics, but I would say, I, actually, I don't know the statistics to be able to say that just by, based on my clinical observation of that client with adenomyosis, symptoms of adenomyosis, most of them were over, you know, a good majority were, um, if I was to guess, 75 to 80% had prior C-section. So it was a significant number more. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's a condition where the uterine lining grows into the wall of the uterus. And it's um, often, what I find with my patients, it often hasn't been mentioned to them. Like it, it showed up on the ultrasound and then but they, they would just prescribe Marina, like the hormonal IUD or the pill as the solution. And they didn't come away with that information that this is what's going on. So I always like to look at the reports and say, okay, that's present. So we need to think about that, treating that specifically. Um, which in my experience, as you said, I, I would believe that there's a risk from surgery, from C-section. It does seem to, the condition itself seems to have a, sort of an inflammatory component not unlike endometriosis, um, as in some of the anti-inflammatory treatments like turmeric and dairy-free diet can, um, and zinc could really help with that. Would you agree? I agree. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. so for adenomyosis, you recommend turmeric, dairy-free, and zinc? Yeah. And also potentially a progesterone capsule. Would you go to a capsule rather than a, a cream when you're looking at? So it depends. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends. It depends on what I'm, you know, using it for. Definitely love like a 200 milligram progesterone, yeah. bioidentical progesterone capsule for a number of reasons because it will help us get a good night's sleep. Now we can only yeah. 
per, that's only available by prescription. So yeah. we have lower dose creams that are over the counter that makes it more accessible. So, um, but definitely there are reasons for the oral because that sleep and the GABA benefits or allopregnenolone benefits can really um, be more substantial than with a cream. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's where we get more of the GABA formation when, it, when progesterone goes through the liver. So that in that sense, the swallowing the progesterone is beneficial. And it also seems to have a stronger effect on the uterus itself. And when, doctors, when patients are speaking to their doctors about it, the way I often what I'll say is phrase it something like, you know, this, this what's called micronized progesterone works as well as some of the other progestin drugs, but has, doesn't have the side effects or arguably has some really nice side benefits. So that is a, a tool that could be used and does seem to work quite well. So yeah, that would be my combination, I guess, dairy-free, turmeric. I do look at some of some other herbal medicine combinations, zinc, progesterone, and another one we should speak about with regard to heavy periods is something called calcium deglucurate. Do you yeah, are you familiar with that supplement? Well, especially for breast protection, right? Yeah. But I've really recommended it mostly when, as part of breast protection combinations versus, tell me for the uterus, for the heavy bleeding as well. Well, it clears estrogen quite strongly mm -hmm. in two different ways. So it actually, it's um, the substrate that the liver, it's, the liver actually uses to bind to estrogen and get, try to get it out of the body. It also helps to downregulate some of the um, bacterial enzyme in the gut that can normally interfere with estrogen clearance. So it has this kind of double benefit for helping to promote, get estrogen out where it's supposed to be going out through the stool. So for that reason, it, what I've just found, like partly through trial and error all, all these years with patients, is that it's probably one of the, for clearing estrogen or removing estrogen, it's one of the stronger supplements that we have. And it's quite safe too and easy and you can, inexpensive and you can take you know reasonably high dose of that so that would be another nice what dosage do you recommend for calcium yeah i knew you were gonna right. that. i want to yeah. say 100 200 but i know it's yeah. not high like the cal when we think of calcium um oh, no. mchc calcium or calcium but other citrate and all those things we're talking about 1000 2000 but really for calcium uh deglucurate yeah. i think it's like 100 200 is a reasonable dose yeah, I'm actually just, I'm cheating. I'm actually just looking in my little book in the dosing section, what I say. Yeah, perfect. Dose. No, the, what the research shows is it's higher. Yeah, it's 1,000. It is 1,000. 1,500. That's what I pulled from the study. So per, I see perimenopause, adenomyosis, uterine fibroids, MS, all those conditions where you need to clear. 1,000, 1,500. Yeah. Probably in combination, in combination formulas is where I've seen it, just 100, 200. So right. it would be smaller. Yeah. 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 So good to know. So just in and of itself, we're good to go up to 1,000 milligrams, even up yeah. to 1,500. Yeah. And sometimes that much is needed. Yeah. And so the expectation, periods should lighten substantially. And because it's just, you know, the normal amount of, um, menstrual fluid to lose in one period is 80 milliliters. So I speak in milliliters. So that would be, that equates to about 16 filled tampons, say over all the, all the days of the period, all the, whatever, four or five days, about eight, eight zero milliliters. And just to put it in perspective, I know with some of these flooding periods that women go through, that can be a lot more than that. Like that can be up in the hundreds, you know, three or 400 milliliters of blood that they're menstrual fluid that they're losing which is will very quickly deplete women of iron so mm -hmm. iron is the other thing iron is probably a, a must for if you've been having periods like that have an eye a blood test for iron and get i agree and ferritin yeah. level let's get our ferritin above 50 um now yeah. with iron replacement we need to mentioned that I actually I did some research on this. So yeah. iron is a pro-oxidant, right? So we want to take iron with vitamin C. We want to take iron with other antioxidants because it is, you know, it is a pro-oxidant. So we have to think about that too. Not just iron by itself should be in a nice combination. What do you think about iron infusions? Are your patients... Sometimes. 
Yep. Times. Yep. 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 I've definitely had clients, you know, borderline so anemic that an iron infusion just changed their world. Yeah. Yeah. For energy and mm -hmm. also replenishing iron, getting that ferritin up can in itself improve periods, mm -hmm. potentially make them less heavy. So that's, you know, that's just another simple intervention and really help energy and help mood. I think that's fantastic. We've covered a lot of information. I want to let our audience know. I mean, I could talk with Laura. Y'all can listen. She's so compassionate, so knowledgeable, so well-researched woman. And I just love, I love our conversations. I love your book. I highly recommend it. And I really feel it's empowering to women to get a handle on our periods, on our cycles. And the earlier we do it, the better our beyond menopause is, right? So um, at Dr. You want to go ahead and give your website, Laura, for your yeah. book and for yeah. um, how people can get in contact with you and yeah. see you and for our people on that side of the world, how they can see you in person, which would be a nice thing too. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to come over to the States at some point and do some little appearances there. I've been meaning to do that for a long time. So maybe early... 2018 I'll get there. I would love it I would love yeah. it we're going to plan a woman's retreat or you know a woman's conference at some point so we'll have to coordinate that with your visit to the east coast Ooh, that might be fun so no that'd be great because I have so, I've met so many interesting people like yourself there's so many other women doing such great work with periods that I just want to have some face-to-face -face contact yeah so I'm at I'm at larabryden.com and all my social media is just at Laura Bryden. And I'd love to, yeah, for people there, I take questions on my blog and um, you know, post about things mostly kind of health related, but a little bit other um, biology related because I'm a, formerly a wildlife biologist. So I also have an interest in, yeah, just kind of nature and that side of things too. Fascinating, fascinating. And so that they can get your book on your website. Is it available on Amazon too? Yeah. Amazon, okay. iTunes, those are the best places to, to obtain that. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I want to thank all our listeners for joining us today on Couch Talk. Now, we will entertain your questions below. So please enter in your questions and email us or contact us and join us on social media and share this interview with your friends and followers as well. We want to get this word out and really empower our young women and our women of all ages to really take control of little things that we can do. Like we mentioned, magnesium supplementation, zinc, calcium, d glucurate just kind of stabilizing uh, our, our endometrium, the, inside, the inner lining of our uterus can make a big difference, create uh, a cessation, you stop a lot of suffering. So I look forward to your feedback and look forward to having you all join in for our next podcast and Couch Talk show. And again, Dr. Lara Bryden, thank you so much for having you, uh, for joining us today from New Zealand. Thank you for having me.